Joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Susan Wild of Pennsylvania. She sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and will be attending that address by Vladimir Zelensky tomorrow. And she recently returned from a congressional trip to the Poland-Ukraine border. She's standing there outside the Capitol. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know it's a busy night for you. One almost gets tired of using the word unprecedented these days. But tomorrow, you're going to be hearing live from the leader of a nation of 44 million people under fire in the largest European land war since World War II, a president who could be killed in that war any day. What are you hoping to hear from that president tomorrow? Well, uh, you know, I, I listened to him address the Canadian Parliament this morning. I expect that it's going to be much the same message, and it's going to be a request um, for continued support, amplified support. I suspect he will again repeat his request for a no-fly zone um, and for transfer of those Russian warplanes, all of which I can fully understand. I also understand why we have not yet engaged in the uh, no-fly zone aspect of that. Um, I am a pro I, I do want to point out that there has been a lot of support sent, and I believe that this administration has done a great job in pulling together our NATO allies and making sure that we're all on the same page. But a decision to escalate um, by uh, enforcing a no-fly zone is something that can't be made just by the United States, and I, the Biden administration has not shown any indication that it's willing to go there, nor have our allies. So. All I can say is I want us to be on the right side of history on this issue. I want to make sure we are doing absolutely everything that we can and that we are standing by ready to appropriate more as necessary um, to help the Ukrainian people. So just picking on what you were saying there, just picking up on that, President Zelensky is expected to ask again for more war material and for a mm -hmm. NATO no-fly zone over Ukraine. Today, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell was asked about that repeated request from the Ukrainian president for a no-fly zone. Have a listen. He already knows that the, the, the U.S. is not going to engage directly in Ukraine. We are not going to enforce a no-fly zone in Ukraine. A growing number of Republican senators are starting to publicly disagree with Mitch McConnell. I just wonder, is there anything that Vladimir Zelensky could do tomorrow to convince you on a no-fly zone? And if not a no-fly zone, where is your line? Because personally, I totally understand why we wouldn't want to set up a no-fly zone. There is a very real risk of World War III and nuclear weapons being used. But where do we draw the line? Is it fighter jets? Is it fighter jets via Poland? Is it just anti-aircraft, small arms, etc.? Where, where do we draw the line? I don't think that we can state an absolute on that, Mehdi. It, the circumstances change day by day. If chemical warfare is entered into, that will change this, the situation considerably. Um, I do think that we have to be prepared to respond on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, and I'm pretty well confident that, that, that we are. I think we have to have troops ready to go if there is a further escalation. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't stop at anything short of a no-fly zone. I would... I, I do believe those Russian war jets should be transferred, if for no other reason. I know I've heard the comments that they wouldn't do that much, it wouldn't be that helpful, but I honestly don't see the downside of doing that. Um, Putin has said that that would be an escalation, but he considers everything to be an escalation, including providing humanitarian aid. And at this point, if President yes. Zelensky wants those warplanes, I think we need to be facilitating transfer of those warplanes. Now, having said that, I'm not the military expert. Um, I do believe that our Department of Defense, uh, that the Pentagon and our intel is extremely good on this. Um, and so I certainly, I, I certainly would not disagree with their position on the no-fly zone. I'm not convinced on these, this transfer of the war jets. And part of that, I have to tell you, having gone to Poland last weekend with uh, eight, members, eight members total, four Democrats, four Republicans, we all left Poland believing that those uh, Russian warplanes were in the process of or very close to being transferred. We were quite surprised when we got, and we were all in agreement that they should be. And then we were quite surprised when there was a change of heart by both the Polish who wanted to send them first to a German uh, to an air U.S. Air Force base in yes. Germany and then a, a change of heart by the DOD. So. Um, I don't know what the rationale is on that, and I'm not convinced that that shouldn't be done. But I think every other form of support, munitions, ammunition, small small uh, hardware, uh, humanitarian aid, 
absolutely needs to be sent. And, you know, this is this is a worldwide problem. This is not just about Ukraine. Yes. And you mentioned you're not the military expert. We talk about what, how we define escalation. Let's talk about de-escalation. The famous Chinese strategist said, Sun Tzu said, give your opponent a golden bridge across which he can retreat. Is there a way of giving Vladimir Putin a face-saving way of getting out of Ukraine, even if he wants to declare victory to his people and just get out? Is there a way of ending this war and finding some diplomatic solution? This is the, the question of the hour, and it's the question of every hour. We have been on in many classified briefings. I have not yet heard anything that sounds like encouraging words that we that there's an exit ramp for Putin. Um, and that concerns all of us tremendously, of course. I honestly believe that the quickest solution may be some sort of uprising by the Russian people or by Putin's closest circle. But we have to make sure we're doing everything to keep Ukraine strong, because that's the only way that Putin will ever um, retreat and or that his, his closest circle will insist that he retreat. But, you know, it, I don't think you can you, I don't think you can engage in diplomatic discussions with somebody who has proven to be a liar, who d goes back on his word, who says that we have a ceasefire over humanitarian missions and then proceeds to bomb civilians. How do you enter into you, di diplomatic relations require some degree of trust? And there is no degree of trust between us, the NATO allies and Putin. Congresswoman, you mentioned earlier that you, you returned from a congressional delegation to the Polish-Ukrainian border. What did you see there in terms of the humanitarian situation? Is Poland being overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of refugees coming across the border? It's now a total of over three million Ukrainians have fled their country. I did not have the impression that they were being overwhelmed when we left. But when we left, they were at 1.5 million refugees, and that has more than doubled at this point. I am hearing reports from people on the ground. I have constituents who have relatives in Warsaw and Krakow who are telling me that, it, that the, the uh, country can't sustain much more of this. Every European country and the United States needs to step up to the plate, and, and Canada as well, and be prepared to accept refugees. I have been calling upon um, the Foreign Relations Committee and the administration to make sure that we are working on that and that there will be, uh, there will be a quick resolution of this in terms of the United States. We are working right now actively, my office is, on getting 600 orphans out of Ukraine into the United States. Um, I think we're, we're going to su succeed in that. These are children Excellent. who were even before um, the invasion. But I also have constituents with family members who are there, who are deeply, deeply concerned, who are ready to offer them a home, jobs, su support. And, and yes, what, the, the picture you're showing right now is at the border. It was 125,000 refugees streamed across the border that day that we were there. We saw people that were just absolutely devastated and exhausted. And that was, you know, that was a week ago, more than a week ago at this point. And so the situation has only got grown worse. Um, by the way, that is one of my constituents that you saw right over my head in that last picture, one of the troops, who, one of the soldiers there. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we are doing our part and that every NATO ally is doing its part. We cannot leave this all up to Poland. They've been doing a commendable job. Don't get me wrong. The Polish people, the Polish government have been absolutely spectacular. But we've got to make sure that we are prepared to do our part, too. Yes, we do. And let's see what the president says tomorrow to Congress. It'll be interesting for you to be there watching. You'll be sitting in a room full of uh, members of Congress, some of whom have spread some pretty crazy conspiracy theories about Ukrainian bio labs and others who, of course, refused to vote to impeach or convict President Trump when he was extorting the guy who will be speaking to you live via video link. Congresswoman Susan Wall, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for taking time. I know you're busy this evening, so we appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.